Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another webinar from A Place in the Sun. My name is Andy Bridge. Today, we're starting our program about six steps to buying your place in the sun. So we like to do this type of thing, particularly in magazines. We like to identify particular steps that people need to take and then provide content to help you identify those areas in which you need to concentrate in able to be able to move forward and uh, buy an overseas property. So I'm not gonna be able to do this on my own. I am joined by two experienced journalists, overseas property professionals, both of them quite relieved, I think today, as their children have, uh, well, in one case returned to school, both of them, and in another case, uh, one's returned and one's yet to return. Liz Rowlinson, how are you today? Good, Andy, thank you very much. Um, uh, yes, uh, li life has got a bit easier um, with one child gone to school and um, I'm looking forward to um, work picking up um, during this September. Um, the market seems to be quite busy um, at home and abroad, so that's all the signs are good. Yeah, indeed. I mean, we had all the exhibitors on a call yesterday and um, quite a lot of them were pretty positive, obviously. The impact of quarantine and the concerns about coronavirus do con continue to affect the market in an adverse way. But there's a lot of activity out there. There's a lot of ingenuity and innovation out there, virtual tours. And indeed, this event, uh, which is replacing our Birmingham exhibition, where we'd normally be lining up to get there later this week. And um, this is just a, a different format, really, exhibitors and webinars digitally rather than, uh, rather than physically at the NEC. Uh, Richard Way, how are you today? I'm well, thank you, Andy. Um, I was just thinking, actually, these, these um, sessions are quite good for uh, isolating myself from the children because it's an excuse for them not to interrupt. So the more, the more we do, the better, as far as I'm concerned. Thank you. Um, yeah, like Liz, I write about overseas property. Um, I have done for nearly two decades. Um, I had a spell as editor on A Place in the Sun. Uh, uh, and now I write for uh, various websites and publications about overseas property. And um, in fact, I was at the very first Place in the Sun Live exhibition, and it just mentioned back in, I think, 2005, 2006. Two, 2005 and, was the first one, yeah. A long time ago now. And I've been... Um, I've attended most of them since then uh, in various capacities. I, I enjoy helping to host the seminars there. Um, and uh, yeah, the other thing I do have a, an overseas home go in Spain, so I have hopefully some first hand experience to go on um, when I'm talking in these sessions. So yeah, here to help and um, help people realize their dream and, and hopefully a little bit more patience while we get out of this. Uh, uncertain time but um, we will come to it will come to an end and then we can all carry on and, and look for that property we want thank you yeah and as I mentioned Liz I think when you're when you're approaching a task like this almost like a great unknown something like buying an overseas property in Spain or Florida or France how on earth do I go about it it's useful to break it down into components and areas where you can focus on a particular area and think okay I now understand that I can move forward with the next bit. I mean, that's a lot of what you do with the, the editorial content that you produce for the, for the magazine and the website, isn't it? Yes, and you, you know, planning is a, is a big part of it. And I, 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 I hear it so many times that the presenters recommend, um, you know, buyers sit down at the very beginning and write, I, I'm a great list writer, but you know, write a list of the things that you want to get from your overseas property. And also, if there's two of you, both write the list and um, see if they actually um, match up. And that's a very good thing to do from the beginning. And then perhaps, you know, you get carried away by looking at stuff online or when you get out there and you can, you can maybe go back to the original list and have you, you know, are you still on track really so um but planning is a great um there's so much we can do online um which which, which this month is about um to, to to plan the different stages and get prepared before you fly out yeah there's there's absolutely there's the interesting bit isn't there which is looking at properties on the place in the sun.com watching the tv show getting carried away with this apartment versus that apartment with a pool without a pool uh, but there are some Let's face it, there are some boring bits to be sorted out as well. Uh, the less exciting bits as to how you're going to get to that point. But they are, they are key if you want to make it um, uh, sort of a straightforward process, aren't they, Richard? Uh, absolutely. And I think key to this whole process is, is building 
the right team who's going to help you. Um, you know, we, we know how to buy, most of us have bought property in the UK and we know the processes and that's, you know, that's complicated enough having to organise your solicitor and if you're getting a mortgage and, and getting the agents in contact, all those sorts of things. Um, so when you're doing it abroad and you're doing it in a different language, you're doing it in a different, the buying process is different, the laws are different. Um, you know, it's, it's a different level of, well, it can be a different level of complication. It needn't be, but if you get the right people in your side, um, and form a team of an agent, uh, lawyer, independent lawyer, your currency person, and if you need tax advice, um, people who have helped hundreds, if not you know, thousands of people um, move or buy a second home, then it, it all becomes a lot easier and, and usually it's, you know, trouble free. Um, but planning is absolutely key. And, and like you say, choosing the location, um, looking online is great and you build up a really good idea of, of areas and prices that fit to the location. But I think it's quite like going out there um, and um, seeing places getting a feel for the immediate vicinity of where it is okay. and your views it's always yeah. um, okay well let's let's just um let's just kick off with that then i'm just going to um share my screen here which i hope you now can all see um so that's the uh that's the title of today's presentation we all know that six steps to your place in the sun Okay, so let's let's start with the obvious area of location. Liz, I, I speak to lots of people that call into the office, contact us through the, the website. They know they want to buy in Spain, for example, but they don't quite know where. They don't need to be as specific as the UK to access work or school. They know they want a place, uh, possibly in a certain costa or, or within reach of a certain airport, but how do you go about from knowing you know you want somewhere in Spain down to okay I'm prepared to buy this property in that specific location what kind of factors should you consider mm. yeah you're right Andy I mean a lot of people do have an area in mind because they go on holiday there all the time but if not I mean you've got Spain I think there are three key things that you consider when if you're buying in Spain I mean you think about climate you think about access and you think about affordability so i mean um the uh, southern spain is a lot warmer year-round sun than the, the northern spain that's one thing access you know airports do you want to drive sometimes then northern spain's practical southern spain not so um and then also affordability you know the, the costa del sol is a, a lot more is more expensive than the costa blanca so those i think are the three key things that generally dictate where people choose and, and then also um, country versus coastal resort, tourists versus um, in the middle of nowhere with, with lots of local authenticity. That's another thing that comes into it, but you can find that pretty much all over Spain. So I think really it's a question of, um, um, you know, sort of access and budget really. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go into that a bit deeper then. I think, yeah, I'd agree with you on those three, on those three key points. So, um, just, just on a quick rundown, so we've got, we got the Costa del Sol then as, as, as kind of more premium, and then where would you put the other costas, Liz, in general terms, in, um, in an affordability sort of index? Well, then you sort of, you go up to, I mean, there's obviously pockets of each, but then you sort of go up to the Costa Brava, which is, a, you know, quite a, you know, um, a sort of a, a, a prestigious fashionable area with the Spanish. So that can be quite very expensive. Um, the, I mean, the, you've got the islands, which are a separate issue really, but then as far as the costas, you, you're then looking at um, uh, the Northern Costa Blanca is more expensive than the Southern Costa Blanca. And then you've got um, Murcia um, and Almeria, which are uh, afford more affordable generally than um, than the northern Costa Blanca um, and then you've got some lesser known costas like the Costa Dorada uh, and the Costa um, del Azahar which can be um, also quite affordable so it's there's a lot to to explore really. Yeah but then of course you've got the islands Mallorca uh, the Balearics um, known for well high quality property high quality lifestyle but again um, towards the, the higher end of the market and then the different islands within the Canary group uh, popular, of course, uh, Tenerife and, and Fuerteventura. Uh, Richard, 
uh, Liz Renfrew's there, the, the Costa Brava is a prestigious area, all the more prestigious for you owning a property there, I believe. Uh, that's right, that's where my uh, second home is. It's, I'm not in the, what they call the Golden Triangle area, which is um, sort of just a bottom bit of the, if you imagine two sections, the northern section, which is based around the Bay of and then you've got the southern section. It's, it's sort of in between the two, um, centered around Begur, uh, and you've got places like Palamos, uh, Plaja Daro, Calonge, um, but especially around Begur, where Liz was referring to these sort of, um, they're more like boutique bijou type resorts. Um, and that particular bit of coastline is characterized by high cliffs with pine trees dripping down them and little coves with very tucked away beaches and you'll find villas uh, sort of clinging to the cliffs there. And, um, and if you go inland a bit, there are people like the, the character, the old farmhouses that they convert into to private properties with olive groves around them. It's, it is nice. So where I am is a bit more, um, a bit more cheerful, sort of family cheerful type resorts. Um, but nonetheless, it's, it's not overrun with British people because of, of where it is. And the climate is another thing. And this actually ties in with what Liz was saying uh, the south of Spain is, does get more sunshine. You get you get mild winters, so you can go. You know, you can expect warm days year round. And I hear of people going in the sea on Christmas Day. You know, in in uh, the Costa del Sol, that's something that would never happen in, in the Costa Brava, where I am. We get very distinct seasons, so you know, winters can be chilly, especially at night. Uh, and that's maybe we are very near the Pyrenees there, so you get the climate that comes from there but you get fantastic views and a very diverse scenery. But that's something to consider when you're looking at your location is seasonality. If you want somewhere that's gonna be, have some life year round where you're gonna get a full, full range of restaurants and shops open, then the Costa Brava, well, a lot of the Costa Brava is not an option because where I go, it's a place called the Scala. After about middle of September, the main sea from where I am, it's, it's, it's shut down, it's boarded up pretty much. Um, and you go from sort of shoulder to shoulder crowd walking along it to uh, one or two locals walking their dog uh, after about September, October. Um, some people like that. It's a different type of, a, you know, you, you meet more local people. It's a different feel and it's, it's peaceful. And like the, the really traditional restaurants that serve the local population will be open. So you get a real feel for the authentic sort of Catalan lifestyle there. Um, but if you want your busy bars and um, lively expat venues open year round, then that's not for you. And you can look at places like parts of Costa Blanca, obviously Costa del Sol, and Canary Islands, probably the, the most important uh, winter sun year round destination of the Canary Islands. Um, they don't really have a true low season there. So that is a very important thing. Seasonality, ask your agent or people you meet there, what is it like here in, not just in winter, but between the seasons, spring, autumn. Um, and that's very important as well if you're going to rent, because it, obviously if you're in a place that's got a year round, is open most of the year, your, your uh, rental market's going to be longer, uh, rather than being the sort of season where I go, the real tourist season is from sort of mid-June until first week of September. And that's it then really. Um, so I guess what you're saying there is identifying, I, I have this down on the, uh, on the slide here, is the lifestyle that you want your property to afford you. So yeah. are you going to rent it out? Do you want to go during the winter months? You may have this idea of this beautifully remote location, but actually you get there and think, oh, it's, it's, it's dark as winter, it's pretty quiet and it's rather remote. And actually that ideal is not, uh, it is not practical. So I guess... At this stage or in this step, it's all about trying to drill down and truly identify what type of property, a lifestyle, what, what sort of lifestyle a particular property in a particular location will afford you. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and like I say, you know, if you go to the Costa Blanca, parts of the Costa Blanca, certainly around Arueli Costa, you know, there, there are places that open year round. And there, is a, there is a resident of a large expat community there. Um, and people will want to be there over Christmas and they'll spend, you know, they'll spend as much time as they can throughout the year because they know that there's always going to be life there and that their favourite part is going to be open or whatever it is. Whereas yeah. you go up to where I am and, and that's not the case. But if you like that, then, you know, you go off, you can be in Pyrene Pyrenees in two hours and you're up almost in a ski resort. 
in the winter. Yeah. So it's 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 what you want. Um, I guess um, I guess I've again on the slide I've got property type here. I guess Liz, there's also no impact on the type of property you choose. You might want a, a, a detached dwelling, but that means gardens and grounds. And generally in Spain, they're quite generous, and that requires upkeep versus a lock up and leave apartment. I mean, do you want to arrive and then have to think about the garden and the maintenance and paying somebody? That, that, that's a key consideration really, isn't it? That's right. And actually that you could, you could argue that that key comes into the key choice of which part of Spain, because if you want a really good choice of brand new properties uh, that are of kind of affordable and not super high end, then you really need to look at certain costas rather than others, like the cost of um, Blanca especially or Murcia or Costa del Sol where there's still still a certain amount of building going on so I think if you want a really good choice of new build um, developments managed um, then, the, then the most popular costas do have the most choice and yeah I mean lock up and leave holiday homes with everything done for you uh, are the ideal scenario for many sort of sort of second homeowners but other people prefer to have some space, a garden, land, but I mean, looking after a pool, it can be expensive if it's just yours. Um, the bigger the land, the more onerous and expensive that becomes to look after. Security can be an issue in the middle of the countryside. So the, it's all things you've got to decide what your level of comfort or, or you know, convenience is really. Yeah, and I guess that's also triggered by something we'll come on to later as to whether it's a holiday home or relocation. Again, relocating and choosing a full-time year-round home is very different from identifying a, uh, a holiday property. Um, as we often see on the TV show, you know, people who are looking to relocate are obviously in the market for a different, in, in, to a different type of property. Uh, Liz, you mentioned, um, or, or we mentioned rentability. What sort of criteria really uh, contribute towards a, a property that you're likely to rent out for a good number of weeks at a decent yield, what would uh, what would you say are the important factors? Well, in, I mean, in, in Spain, I mean, the, the, it depends on the on the location, but in Spain, you know, the holiday apartments on managed complexes with a, with nice amenities, family pool, etc., they're they're what a lot of people are after. So um, you're gonna ha you're gonna need to look at you know popular coastal resorts, um, it, places you can easily walk to from the beach. Um, good amenities, um, not too, not too uh, much of a huge transfer, more than an hour, 90 minutes from an airport, um, and sort of a clean, clean new property, um, modern um, outside space. Um, that these are all things that renters um, like these days. Um, Wi-Fi is pretty essential. So in many ways, sort of modern newish properties are, are perhaps often easier to rent but other again other people like charming historical characterful properties but um it, it really depends on you, you you're going to need to research that and this is what agents should be able to help you with um when you're buying as well yeah richard do you think that there are in different markets in, or in particularly in different countries uh, people have a more fixed idea of where they want to buy often when i speak to somebody who's looking to buy in france they specifically know they want to be in the Dordogne or a particular region of France, whereas there are a lot of buyers in Spain who really they're focusing on, okay, their nearest airport is Manchester. There are good affordable flights to a particular airport and they draw an hour's, uh, a circle an hour radius from the airport and that will, that will suit them. It's more driven by, by ease. Whereas, I don't know, um, possibly the same in Italy, Liz. You know, people get a very fixed idea of a place that they're in love with more in, in, in France or Italy, do you think, Richard? Uh, yeah, I think if you take Spain, I think I think it's fair to say that a lar uh, the, the largest section of the market, people wanting to buy, they want to be on the coast. They want a mix of, of um, expat lifestyle and probably a bit of uh, Spanish lifestyle as well, or the option to have a bit of both. Um, and they want sunshine and they want a nice outdoor lifestyle. Um, and then it comes down to really which of the costas that offer all those you can afford and which, uh, and I mean, a good example. So often I speak to agents and speak to their, I do case studies of, of buyers and many times I've spoken to people and they bought in, for example, the Costa Blanca having never been there. 
because they've got a, they know exactly what they want from their property. They want they want sunshine, they want easy access to the beach or a seafront, and they want an affordable lifestyle, al fresco lifestyle, where they can go have a drink in the evening on the prom, have a nice meal. Um, and in Spain, it's very easy to achieve that. So you really have to then match. You have to pick a cost that maybe fits your budget or or the climate, like I was saying. But um, and so people go to these places for the first time, and because it, they, it is so so on tap in Spain, these, these things that they they realise that actually, yeah, this is where I want to be. Um, maybe if they'd gone to the Costa del Sol the first time as well, and the budget fits, they would buy there because it is there. But and but yeah, the, the diversity of buyers is perhaps. Uh, broader in other countries where France for example a lot of people yeah they like they buy in the southwest they're looking for a rustic character home as they say within walking distance of the boulangerie um, and that's a large part of the market but then some people want to be on the coast in France so they might look at the long dock or if they've got a large budget they'll go to the Côte d'Azur or if the climate's not so important they'll look in Brittany um, uh, and then you've got the whole skiing market. So there's a diverse, more diverse market perhaps in, in France. Um, and then Florida, again, you know, Central Florida, Disney, the Disney purchases, that's another whole uh, niche market if you like. Where people want to buy with easy reach to the theme parks. Um, and that's a top priority. Yeah, so I guess in summary, when it comes down to the location is identifying, I guess it's an obvious thing to say really, but really drilling down into it is what's important to you and what sort of lifestyle do you really want to um, enjoy with your property um, and making sure that is what you want rather than what you think you want. So just Absolutely. before we move on to our uh, at step number two, I'm just going to run a quick poll, a very straightforward question for my interest as much as anything. Who's serious about buying an overseas property? Are you just dropping in because you're curious or are you serious and motivated? It'd be nice to know that there's quite a few motivated people out there. Um, but we're a broad church. We're happy if you're just uh, starting out on the journey and just curious for now. So let's see what that result brings in. Mm. I'm always and, serious. And there we and there we go. Um, that managed to pick up something from my phone and start um, Alexa or whatever that was. Uh, Siri, I do apologize. It recognized uh, something on there. So let's switch that down. So that, that's, well, that's wonderful. Well, 80% of you who are here today are serious and motivated about buying an overseas property. 20% uh, of you uh, are curious. Um, I guess the motivation there, a lot of it is driven by Brexit for people looking to buy in the EU, but that's something we'll come on to, well, certainly another day uh, we might touch on later uh, today as well. So let's move on to slide two. So the location we have decided upon and we're now drilling down into where we might like to buy and we begin to look at the, the purchase process. So um, I know we've discussed this many times before, um, but it's an important point. Liz, an independent lawyer, why would you? Well, I mean, you wouldn't buy a property in the UK without using a lawyer. In fact, you can't. So, I mean, uh, going abroad where you don't speak the language, you don't know the process, you don't know the, the, the system is equally important, um, more important. And um, it's really important to use a lawyer because um, even though it's a notarized system in Spain, the notary is just the sort of the, the, uh, the administrative person who sort of rubber stamps the whole process, whereas the lawyer is acting just for you if you appoint a lawyer. So the lawyer can, from the word go, advise you on negotiating for a property, checking, checking it out, um, um, do all the do all the due diligence um just basically fight your corner and and protect you on every part of the process um and if you haven't got that um you might un unwittingly um overlook something or 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 get uh, persuaded into doing something that, that you might regret later okay richard that's something you would echo i'm sure uh definitely um you know, we use a lawyer when we buy a solicitor when we buy a property in the UK, um, and we wouldn't dream of not doing that. So why would you go go to a different country where the language is different, 
the laws are different, the buying process is different, it's notarized buying press in most of Europe. Um, and most people I imagine aren't fluent in legal Spanish or legal French enough to understand contracts themselves. And then invest for, for most of us lifetime savings or the proceeds from, from a, their main home um, without, without legal protection. Um, which for, for an insignificant fee means that you can buy and you can, you know, even enjoy the whole buying process rather than the worrying that, you know, are you doing the right thing right the way through? Um, so yeah, absolutely. Get, get a good independent lawyer who's bilingual, who you feel comfortable with and who understands the market where you're going to be buying uh, and, and really you shouldn't encounter any problems during the process. And Liz, we, um, this is often a, a, a thorny subject um, at exhibitions, but recommendations from from estate agents. I mean, we, we always say, you know, don't take the recommendation. You go off and find your own lawyer. But on the other hand, a, a good agent in a local area will know the, uh, the lawyers who have maybe worked on that development before or understand the area or well, well versed in dealing with British buyers. So it's not automatically um, ruled out to be, to, be, to be introduced to a lawyer, I guess. But then ultimately it is about finding a lawyer that's representing you and your interests uh, rather than the agent who's generally representing a vendor. Sure. I mean, back in the, the sort of the, the boom days uh, in Spain, um, I mean, there came the, the, con the idea that um, a, a, an agent, some agents might suggest um, a lawyer who's basically working for them and, and, and basically ends up, work, you know, not really working for you. But now, I mean, um, a lot of the agents, Agents, all the agents we work with have got long, um, they're putting themselves out there, we've, they've got a good track record, they're, they're regulars um, uh, at our exhibitions. So, you know, recommendations from them are not going to be um, um, inappropriate. So, I mean, I think they, they do know the best people. They do, um, you know, they do know people who are good to work with and good with customers. So um, it makes sense for you to, to, um, to take their advice on that score. Yeah. And this uh, webinar, as I'm sure uh, our audience watching know, is part of our September series, our digital event. Um, there's a new website where everything to do with this event is hosted. That's a place in the sun digital.co.uk. And over on there, on our exhibitors section, I think we have uh, probably four or five different lawyers. Certainly, we've got uh, three, I think, in, in Spain. Uh, we have a Portuguese lawyer, we have a French lawyer. Um, so there are people there who can help you uh, uh, research this process more fully. Just head over there, click on the exhibitor page, and you can even book a meeting with them via Zoom uh, if that's what you would like to do. So, okay, let's move on to the bit that gets everybody excited, the bit that uh, will be on TV in our wonderful new series of A Place in the Sun at four o'clock this afternoon, which is the, the, the property hunt. And the property hunt naturally brings you into contact with estate agents. When uh, on, a, on a webinar yesterday, I made the, the point that uh, estate agents overseas certainly seem to work a lot harder than they do in the UK, um, which, is, which is my take on things. What's your, just, just talk us through the role of the agent. I mean, it's obvious in some ways, Liz, but um, how is it possibly different from the UK? And why would you um, sort of recommend getting in touch with one early, early on? Yeah, some people know about the hefty commissions involved abroad, but I mean, agents for helping international buyers do a lot more than um, UK estate agents. So, uh, I mean, it might be from, from initial conversations to finding out what you want to um, meeting, you know, they might meet you off um, when you fly out, um, take you round, take you for dinner, discuss um, exactly what you want. Um, um, they should listen to you. Um, help you decide on those areas we were talking about earlier about which area might suit them best um, and then they will sort of they might recommend the lawyer they might help them set up a, uh, the lawyer or, or they might help them the, the, the customer set up a bank account get an NIE number um, all the bits that they'll need to help them through the process um, and then it's a question of hand holding them in through the whole um, looking at properties, um, discussing whether they can renovate them, um, pros and cons, um, how how much it might cost to to do up something, uh, any work, 
at everything really. But Richard, the an agent, if you if you've taken step one and identified where you want to buy, then an agent is probably going to have a decent handle on the properties that are available in that particular area, even if they're not directly on their books. Is that fair to say? Uh, uh, definitely. Certainly in, in Spain, I know agents, they work, um, you know, they will have affiliations or they'll work together. Uh, and if they have a client and they don't have a property on their own listings that fits their, their brief or matches what they want, but they know there's another property uh, on the same development or, you know, on, in the same resort that will fit them, then they'll, they'll get in touch with the agent who is marketing that often on your behalf as the vendor, as the buyer. And, um, try and line that up for them as well. And they'll work out any commission split between them. It won't affect you as the, as the buyer. So, yeah, I mean, I guess the way to look at it is if you're, if you're trying to buy a property in Spain or France or whatever, and you're based in the UK, you're not going to be able to hop over there every weekend to do viewing. It's just not possible. And you'll go and do a viewing trip and maybe you'll see somebody you like in the space of a few days. But you, if you haven't found something in that space of time, you're going to rely on your agent um to hopefully go and find you and, and bring you other options and you'll be checking the websites as well obviously but really your agent is, will be your eyes and ears on the ground in whichever country you're looking and good agents you know they will they will embrace what you want they'll know you're a serious buyer and they will do their best to find something whether it's on their own books or it's it's with another agent who they work with um and that's a normal way to look at it um you know, they know that it's, it's, it's a case of logistics and, and you can't always get out to see things. So find a good agent. You shouldn't really need more than one or two agents um, in an area or areas. Maybe they overlap and they'll share some areas to, to go and find your property. Um, and that's the best way to, to look at it. And they'll do a lot for you, won't they? If you, if, you, if you get yourself out there and you've made contact with them before, then... You know, they'll happily pick you up at the start of the day and whiz you all over the place showing you properties. I mean, that's what they, um, that's oh, what they yeah. live for, isn't it? Uh, yeah, no, I think that they enjoy that part. You know, they enjoy meeting people and finding, finding uh, them their dream home, like you see on the programmes, you know, when they sit down at the end of the day and they, they have a glass of wine and toast the property they've found. So, and, and the good thing, the good agents will, you know, the days of pressure selling and, and getting, getting their client and, shielding them from anyone else and making sure that they only buy from them and only see these properties. I think, I think we've the markets matured. It's that those days are over. Good agents understand that people, you know, some people want a lot of space and they don't, you know, they're happy to go and do a lot of searching on their own. Other, other people want as much help from the agent as possible. And that, so they'll gauge what sort of client you are and they'll adapt their services to that. But if you want a full blown um, viewing trip where they will, pick you up from the airport they'll arrange a hotel for you often with the subsidized rates they'll meet you for dinner in the evening which is you might not want that sort of contact but you know they might show you restaurants that you wouldn't otherwise find those little gems tucked away down a side street that sells you know does the best paella in town whatever it is so um you know you tell them how much interaction you want uh, what sort of time you want to get picked up in the morning how many properties you want to see in the day um and then and they always say spending time in the car with your agent between properties is actually really valuable because not only will they give you a free tour of the area and they'll probably take you on routes around the resort or town to show you things you might not discover yourself like where the nearest shops are or particular types of businesses you might need whatever it is they'll also it's good talking time so you'll sit in the car and you know get an idea from them about what their lifestyle is like most a lot of the agents they started out as buyers like people listening and they moved over there and somewhere or other they've ended up working in a state agency there that's um, true we have a lot of expatriate british uh, estate agents, whether it's joanna oh, no, leggett in no. france or um yeah uh, pat tan in florida or uh, chris white in portugal at ideal homes and also in spain so many of them are expatriate british people who I mean, they know these things. They know that, uh, I don't know, whatever might be important to you. You can't walk your dog on the beach from May to September or where to get your Sky Sports subscription supplier or, or all that kind of stuff. They've done it, haven't yeah. they? That's it. And the, the other key difference as well between um, agents, overseas agents and, and agents in the UK, or what we're used to back in the UK, is, is after sales. And they like to make, I mean, this is something that needs to be, you know, really trumpeted because uh, good agents, again, you stop, you don't stop being a client once you've signed um, on completion day. 
you know, once you move in, you might want your locks changed, you might need new air conditioning, you might need a satellite dish installed, all those things that you might only discover only a week or two after being in the property or even later. And, and the and agents will, you know, they're welcome. You go back and they'll help you. They'll point you in the right direction, recommend trades people. Um, and then they'll probably, a lot of them offer key holding as well. So if you're a second homeowner, um, you, by the time you complete, you already know the agency. You've got probably got friendly with staff there and you can trust them and they'll offer you a key holding service so that, um, you know, you've got uh, some eyes and ears on the ground when you're not there. And if there's a problem and you need someone to go around and check the property, they're there to do that. Uh, so yeah, a different, a different type level of service to, to in the UK. Okay, thanks Richard. And uh, yeah, just another mention over at our website, a place in the sun digital.co.uk under the meet our exhibitors section. We've got our exhibitors listed out by country and you can see the estate agents click on there and a number of them have put up virtual tours, which um, a lot of them are working with at the moment. So you can uh, two, three minute videos taking you through particular properties in particular locations. And if there's something you like there or something you'd like more information on, that you can either message them from that page, there's a message box, or you can indeed book a Zoom meeting. There's a schedule for when they're available on each of their pages. So, okay, let's move on to, uh, to our next slide and our next step in the process, the painful bit. I think that's why I put a black tint on this, um, paying for your property. So Liz, you, um, you interview a lot of people who have, have just bought and um, key drivers, key moments in life. Why, why, does it, why does it kind of happen to certain people at a certain time? What, what, what brings that about? Yeah, and actually, um, most of, you know, whether you see them on the TV show or the one of the, 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 the lots I interview for the magazine, um, pretty much of them are all cash buyers. Um, it's interesting. Um, and it's that is because um, they generally are in their 50s. Um, they've reached a point in life, they've, they've saved hard working for this, this, this goal um, when they, the, maybe the children are leaving home. Um, they get a bit more freedom for themselves. They want to either slow down a bit or take the, 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 the put off the, the work pedal and do some other things or they will actually want a new adventure. They kind of tend to fall into either of those uh, sort of speed up or slow down type category. Mm -hmm. And um, and they will, yes, they'll have maybe a, a parent, they might have an inheritance is another big factor. Um, but generally they will have both been saving for for sort of 30 years and be sort of keen to to sort of uh, make the most of it um, and and get their little place abroad. And Richard, I think we, we also here to, to counter that slightly, I do agree with you, Liz, we also have that best of both worlds person who wants to maybe downscale in the UK, release some equity from a property here, but keep a foothold to keep contact with grandchildren, take, take money out. That's, that's quite a, uh, a well-known and well-used vehicle, isn't it, Richard, for funding an overseas property purchase? Yeah, absolutely. Or um, it's not unknown, people want to keep Cut some kind of income from the UK as well, sterling based income. So they'll downsize or buy, say, a flat or an apartment to, to rent out. Um, and then they'll move over um, and buy their main home to wherever it is, France, Spain, Italy. Uh, and, and then they've got the security of, of some income coming from the UK. And of course, if they ever did go back, they know there's a, they've got a, a property there they can move into. Um, how you do that? Financially, I mean, there's so many different uh, combinations of releasing equity or do you get a mortgage? I mean, mortgage rates at the moment in Europe are, you know, they've, they've sort of been trundling along at historic lows for a few years now. The Eurobor is in negative territory uh, and you can get incredibly cheap mortgages, even as a non-resident buyer. Um, so that's something to consider, even if you are if you are buying a second home, for example, as a cash buyer. Um, and you're going to rent it out, it might make sense to, to get a mortgage, um, especially if you're going to, be, uh, uh, going to be getting your rental income in euros and you've got a euro mortgage. Um, and, and given at the moment that the pound is relatively weak, you know, it might make sense rather than um, transferring your sterling into euros at a historically poorish rate. Um, might make sense to get a euro mortgage, take advantage of the very low rates and get rental income in euros and hold on to your sterling back here. 
you know, but speak to, speak to uh, mortgage brokers, speak to some financial experts, um, people like Levins Franks who are involved with the, the event to get more uh, details about that. Um, and at what point, at what, but, sorry, Richard, to cut across, at what point, Liz, are you going to be asked for uh, an amount of money if you've, you've you found your location, you're dealing with an estate agent, you find the property that you want, what are you going to be asked for at what stage? Well, it's really good to get a, it's really good to get a sort of mortgage, um, start talking to people before you go, if you want to get a mortgage, to get an offer in principle and find out how much um, you can borrow. Um, and and then um, when you when you do finally get out and you can you can you can be in a very good position to act quite quickly um, because you will need to put up, down a deposit when you reserve a, a property um, whether it's a new or a, a resale property. So um, you know I I would just try and sort out. This is one of the things you can do while you're stuck here and not a, not necessarily going to fly out to Spain is is get all this have these discussions all in preparation for before you go. Yeah, so um, it's, a, it's a deposit offer, a, a deposit at the time of the offer, property should get taken off the market at that stage and then it's completion and that's when you pay, pay out on the balance, I guess. Yeah, I mean- Yeah, and a lot of people are doing, um, a lot of people are having sort of flexible clauses on the length of completion because obviously with, at the moment it's, it's quite, travel is quite difficult so um you can get that as part of the contract that you're not tied to a certain date people have to make allowances and richard if i was buying a new build property um or indeed sorry if i was buying one off plan again what payments would fall when typically i know it uh, depends on the contract and you get a lawyer to check all that for you but just give us an overview of that uh, yeah, and, and obviously this will vary depending on the developer and different developers have different payment schemes um, and even different projects might be different. But generally you'll see a property uh, you, or you'll visit, normally you'll visit the site, it might be just ground, they might not have broken, started the groundwork, pick a plot uh, and then you decide the plot you want, you'll reserve it and that will go with most properties in Spain, you'll pay a reservation deposit which could be between, I don't know, two and 5,000 euros, say two, two to 3,000 euros. That takes off the market, that reserves it for you. Um, and then the next step will be um, some kind of deposit, first deposit for an off plan, uh, which will normally be due within 28 days of, of reserving um, of your reservation deposit. And that could be 10%. And then after that, it really does depend on the developer. Some developers are very, uh, very accommodating and, and they don't want the final balance due on com until completion but generally you'll probably have to make maybe two other payments between before completion and they will be they will be according to specified points of construction completion of construction so it might be once the shell is up of your building and then you'll pay another 30 percent and then it might be once the roof is on these are these are just examples um you pay another 30%, so then you've got the remaining 30, 30, 60, the remaining 30 on completion the day you get the keys. Um, and that typically could be over 12 months uh, from start to finish, or it depends on, I mean, there'll be some room for a few weeks, maybe delay. So let's say in total, it's between 12 and 15 months. Um, I mean, the advantage of that, of course, is you're not having to pay everything up front in one hit to get for your property so if you if you are you are if you would rather release the funds however you're going to pay for it in stages it suits you your situation then that's that's a good thing the other thing to be wary of though when you're paying stage payments is of course the currency fluctuations will affect uh how much your each payment is to you in sterling um and if it swings a lot over the course of the year what you're expecting if your final payment is 50,000 euros and at the time of signing the contract, that's worth so much in sterling. By the time you come to complete, if the rates move a lot, it could be more expensive in sterling to you. But there are, there are devices and, and tools that currency experts can, can offer to you, forward buying currency, for example, to make sure that you get a fixed exchange rate when you need it. So um, that's a forward contract that you would, You'd, you'd, you'd be happy with the rate today, so you forward fix that rate for six months time when you have to pay yeah. 50,000 euros and then you, you yeah. can sleep easy knowing that that's going to cost you 45,000 pounds. 
Exactly. If you spoke to your, I mean, the, the rate that they offer you will be something based on what the current rate that day is. It won't necessarily be that rate that they're offering to spot people on buying spot, but they will say, uh, because they're, you know, they're taking a hedge against what it could be as well, but they're, they're prepared if you like to take that risk and say, right, in six months time or 10 months time, when you need to make your final payment, 50,000 euros, we guarantee this exchange rate to you. And you know, at that, at that point, whatever happens between then and now and that point to the exchange rate, you're going to get that exchange rate. So, you know, so you could, you, you could lose out if the exchange rate moved in your favor. Yeah, exactly. I mean, some people do, they like to, to forward buy maybe half of what their final balance will be. And this can be whether it's off plan or resale and you know, you're going to need so much to complete. They'll go 50, 50 so that if the rate does swing in your favor and sterling strengthens, you know, you're, you're only hedged to half of that. And then if not, it goes the other way, at least you know you've got a fixed rate. But I always say to people when they're talk, talking about exchange rates and, oh, I, I know it's going to improve and I don't want to buy. When you're buying a property abroad, you're not, you're not, um, you're not trading the world currency markets or trying to, to beat the markets. Your, your, your goal is to buy successfully um, and for a price that you're happy with uh, a property abroad and, and that should be your ultimate goal not along the way I'm going to try and try to beat the currency markets because even professionals in the city fail at that often enough and lose money so I think this forward currency getting a, an exchange rate that will guarantee what your property costs is a great thing because it brings peace of mind to your to your purchase and it means you can relax throughout yeah okay maybe the rate swings a bit because you've forward bought and maybe it's going to cost you another two thousand pounds but hey hang on a minute you're buying a property that to you is great value anyway compared to what you would have in the uk so everything balances out if you can afford it you get peace of mind i think you're doing well and a quick shout out to uh, my colleagues at a place in the sun currency they're exhibitors at uh, this month's event uh, they're also mentioned on uh, quite heavily on a place in the sun.com and they're certainly well set up. They specialise in dealing with British people who are buying property. That's pretty much, uh, pretty much um, all that they do. So uh, yeah, that's a place in the Sun currency. We also have coming up in our masterclass days. We have Spain masterclass on Sunday, and then we have masterclasses for Portugal and for France and for Cyprus, and certainly for Spain, France, and Portugal. We have a session on mortgage availability. So we've got a particular mortgage broker in each of those markets who can talk to you about buying, uh, about arranging a mortgage from a, a Portuguese or a French or a Spanish bank and what sort of rates are available, what loan to value you can get, how much deposit and how much you can borrow. Um, so again, check out, check out those webinars. Um, I know you know where the webinars are because you're here watching and uh, see if there's any more of those that you'd like to sign up to over the coming weeks. Okay. So, before we move on to our next question, I am just going to run another poll. Um, what I'd like to know now is how many people are looking to buy a holiday home and how many people are considering relocating permanently and getting the hell out of here and getting somewhere over there. So relocation or a holiday home. I know things can change. It might start as a holiday home or semi-retirement, but um, generally, are you looking at you know what? I'm going to stop it there. It was, oh, it was 48.52. I've done that joke before. But anyway, it is 47.53. So um, it's normally more for the holiday home and, and uh, slightly fewer for the permanent home, I think. But um, Liz, it's true that a lot of people do want to get out of here right now. And questions come through. I've got one here from Alexis Beldum about, can I still get an NIE number in time uh, to get out to Spain before the, uh, the Brexit deadline? What's, um, what are you saying to people who invariably ask you that sort of question, Liz? Oh yeah, there's plenty, there is time, definitely. Um, but I, I slightly disagree with you. I think, especially this last year, as we sort of run up to the Brexit deadline, I think the permanent movers have been slightly predominating because there's a lot of people, okay. as you point, getting the hell, want to get the hell out of here. So, um, and there's, there's still, we're only in, all, we're only in um, September. And there is time to to get an NIE number, um, open a bank account, and 
get a permanent address by the end of the year, which is really what you have to do if you want to move to Spain and enjoy the benefits um, that we do as being a member of the EU uh, still at this, at this point um, before, before next year. So, Richard, I guess the, 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 the sort of general thinking at the moment is if you get out there and get residency before we leave the EU, those, re those residency rights will remain intact. Is that right? Uh, yeah, as, as things stand, um, the transition period that we're still in until the end of this year, if you move to a, year, to a country in the EU, uh, you retain all the rights that any other EU citizen has, which we've had UK citizens have had as an, as an EU citizen. Um, so that gives you the right to move to that country and reside there. That gives you the right to reciprocal health care, um, especially if you're a pensioner with your S1 form. Um, you have the right to work in these countries, freedom of passage, so you have free travel to and from the countries. Um, and you get, we get all that because currently our status, although Brexit has happened, but our status hasn't changed as citizens. So that the rules, that the, the agreement, the withdrawal agreement says that as from 31st of December, we no longer stop having EU citizenship status. Um, so, and, and the status, and with that, if we move before the end of the, the transition period, we retain the rights that we have. Um, we, we get as we, by moving before then. So by moving to Spain now, uh, that gives us the right to continue living there. We keep those rights that we have when we move there. That's how things stand. Um, and there's all sorts of different uh, concepts and, and possibilities that might happen between uh, the UK and individual EU countries. Um, already France is talking about a, a six month uh, grace period after the end of the year for getting residency I believe Liz is that I know you were talking about it the other day so it's you know I, th I think um, until, until a, a new agreement is, is confirmed the safest option is, is to move to your chosen country in the EU before the end of the year um, and at least get settled there I know they're telling you if, if you're settled and you can prove that you've been living there and um, it will make your chance of residency better. But move there and apply for residency um, and, and, and do everything that you need to get a residency. You want to start building an identity in a new country. So you need a permanent address, whether you've bought somewhere or you've, um, you're renting somewhere with a contract. You need to be able to have a contract that shows you've got a permanent home there. You want to have a bank account and show that you've got in funds incoming. So you've got, you're receiving income to, to, to sustain your lifestyle there. You want to register for healthcare, whether that's private or if you can, if you do um, qualify for it, get on the state, state, state social security system, get state healthcare. Uh, you want to register with the town hall in Spain or the Padron, they call it there, so that you're on the electoral roll, you're seen as a citizen living within a certain community. And all these things start to build a case for you showing that I am settling in this country and then you apply um, to get your residency. Um, and exactly how it will be on the 1st of January 2021 with different countries, I don't think anyone can say for sure at the moment, but if you've done all those things I've just said, you're gonna have a very good chance of getting residency. The worst that can happen is that you have to go through some kind of visa process, like plenty of non-European citizens do already, third country nationals, they call them. Um, and it will just be a slightly more complex way of, of trying to get a, a residency visa but it's certainly not going to be at, um, off the table and Australians, South Africans, Americans, Asians are moving to France, Spain all the time quite easily so it's it's really a case of do it now for, for absolute ease and guaranteed of residency leave it a bit longer we don't really know at the moment but I don't I think if you if you if you start establishing yourself you're going to have very good case of getting residency anyway. Yeah, so the, the, the drawbridge is not going to come up um, no. in the new year, is it, Liz? Uh, still going to be important British expatriate communities in France and Spain, and they'll want to add to those numbers, I'm sure, with, uh, with residency status, just as Richard says, potentially a different, a different application process. Yeah, I'm sure they're going to. We're going to come. They're going to come to some agreement that um, that British people will be able to enjoy um, the sort of the freedom of movement and and some of the fre the flexibility. Um, as there's so many um, thousands of sort of you know homeowners over there 
that um, that they they do now. Um, they don't want to um, cut us off uh, as a sort of a great um, investors in their country. Okay, thank you, Liz. All right, let's um, let's just move on to our final slide which is about owning an overseas property. Hopefully that's the feeling that it generates in people once they've got one. Richard, you own, uh, we haven't got a great deal of time left, but um, responsibilities as an overseas property homeowner, how would you tick them off? Uh, okay, you've got your usual things you have anywhere. So utility costs, your water and electricity, mains gas if you're on it, um, it's still color gas in a lot of parts of Spain. Um, and then if you have an internet connection, not a huge amount in, in, in typical costs to the UK for that. Although your usage might be different if you have air conditioning like I do, um, you, you'll see a spike in your electricity bills at the end of the summer when you've had them running when you're there. Um, other costs you're gonna have, you have um, rates or council tax, which is, a, is significantly less in Spain. Uh, so I have a, a, three, a small three bedroom villa and my council tax for the year which is paid in about three tranches throughout the year, uh, is about four to 500 euros. So, you know, what's that? You know, say 400 sterling, 450 sterling, compared to what would you be paying in, in a, you know, in the UK for a three bedroom house, not all. So um, the other thing you need to bear in mind in some countries, and this applies to Spain, is even if you do not rent out your property, they have something called non-residency, non-residence income tax. Um, and you have to file a return each year. It's the end of each calendar year has to be in by um, basically declaring that you don't rent out your property, um, but for the privilege of not renting out your property, you, sm you have to pay a small percentage of the catastral value, which is the, uh, the value that's the rateable value, they call it. Um, and that's basically declaring, it's, it's, it's like a notional tax, uh, but you must do that even if you don't rent out your property. Um, and I pay about 180 euros a year for that. Uh, and I get someone to do that for me. In fact, the, wherever you are, you'll, you'll, there'll be a, an agency, a property management agency, um, who can look after things like that for you. And they'll even look after the bill payments if you want them to. So each year, a lady I know, she, she files the return for me, pays that tax, sends me confirmation that that's done. It, it has, I mean, it is the case that a lot of people haven't bothered to do that. In, over the years and they haven't really been picked up on it um, but I do know of cases where people who've come to sell and it's been flagged up um, by the notaire or, or a lawyer that this property is five, ten, how many years behind with their non-residence income tax and you know the property can't be sold until it's cleared right. so uh, it will catch up with you just to bear that in mind. Um, that's one cost. The other thing is if you rent out your property and you have a property management company doing the changeovers or even handling all your bookings, you know, you're going to pay them a, a fee for doing that. Typically would could be 10% a month, 10% uh, of, of your bookings, but it, speak to them and, and find out what different services cost. Yeah. Uh, okay. If you're in a community, just, this is an important one. If you yeah. are on part of a community or a complex or anywhere with communal areas, could be landscape gardens, could be swimming pools, car park, um, then everyone who has a residence within that complex community will have to pay for the upkeep, obviously, and they share that. So everyone has a, has a fee to pay, usually monthly, um, and that goes towards the running cost of that. So that's an important thing to ask when you're looking at a property on a community or complex because they vary a lot. It could be 50 euros a month, it could be 200 euros a month, depending on the facilities, but you don't want to find out after moving in, you've got an extra cost that you haven't planned for. Okay, and um, of course, they're the um, they're sort of the, the taxes and the death side of it there, but also the lifestyle, uh, obviously owning an overseas property uh, enables you to enjoy a wonderful addition to your lifestyle. Let's just see if I can uh, bring something up for us here and also a plug for uh, one of the webinars that Liz is running on Saturday, I believe, Liz. So uh, we managed to yes. put together we managed to put together a, a bunch of webinars: one with Johnny, one with Jasmine, and one with Laura. We're calling them our revisited series. So we're getting a couple who bought off the TV show, getting them back on. Uh, we've got access to the TV footage, and I think you have a couple from Cyprus on 
Saturday morning. Is that right, Liz? I believe we're going to be talking to them, yes, to find out, um, you know, everyone loves finding out what happened, um, you know, did they definitely buy it, What? how, how did they get on um, a year later, so um, I'll be looking forward to, to interviewing them. Yeah, so that's, um, I think that's Andy and Linda May, who've now been resident in Cyprus for about a year, and then um, Jasmine's doing one and Laura's doing one, in particular this is um, this is one of my favourites. This is um, this is Laura. This is, this is a reaction that it can can get if uh... I don't think we can see anything Andy if that's what the plan is oh can you not see that no oh, oh sorry sorry folks let me just bring that back ah apologies yeah. for that oh here we go yeah. I must be getting old and soppy. That brings me to tears every time. I've watched it twice today and I well up on each occasion. So uh, that's me, but that's enough about me. So um, thank you for attending today. Thank you for your questions. They're quite specific about um, pensions in Cyprus or buying in Turkey. Uh, we are gonna reply to those individually now. So we will come back to you individually, a little bit too specific for this section, um, but we have uh, experts over in our exhibitors uh, pages who you can put those questions to and we will help you identify the companies that you uh, that you may want to speak to so um, tomorrow night we have a quiz we have a mystery guest coming along for all of you who have turned up today I'll tell you that is the lovely Amanda Lamb who's joining us tomorrow evening and then we have Liz's session on Saturday morning and we have our Spain masterclass day where we break down all these elements into more detail uh, throughout the course of Sunday that takes place from about 10.30 in the morning all the way through till four. So lots of chance there for really detailed questions and yet putting more uh, meat on the bones than we've been able to do in a one hour session, generic session about all sorts of countries today. So thank you, Liz. Thank you, Richard. Good to see you as always. Thank you for your input. Thanks, and it's goodbye from me and it's goodbye from them. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Bye all.